The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Variety Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericavariety.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Crime Prevention 101. We're so happy you joined us this week. Over the next hour, you'll learn the tips, tricks, and vital information that will help you keep yourself confident and safe. Now, here's your host, Susan Bartlestone. Well, hello there, and good evening. I hope you're all doing well tonight. This is Susan Bartlestone, and that means Crime Prevention 101 is on the air. And we do this every Thursday night from 8 to 9 p.m., and I'm talking about Eastern Time because I'm coming to you from the ever-exciting New York City, the scene of the crime, as I like to call it. And I just want to remind you to check out my Crime Prevention 101 fan page on Facebook, and I'd love to have you join the party there with me as well. Now, last week I did a really informative show on bullying with with a world-renowned bullying expert. Her name is Barbara Coloroso. And she was the specialist that was called in by the South Hadley, Massachusetts School District. That's the one where the young suicide victim, Phoebe Prince, attended, the, the one who's getting all this, appre- this press, and rightly so. And I also spoke with Robin Sachs and State Stacey Dittrich from Justice Interrupted about criminal and legal aspects of bullying. And um, by the way, that, uh, that show is available on the, my uh, podcast as a, on my host page in case you didn't catch it. But anyway, bullying is such an important topic and there are so many wrinkles to it that I thought I'd present another angle on it. And my guest tonight is school psychologist and psychotherapist Israel Kalman, who's also a bullying expert, and he's the one that's bucking the school bashing trend and coming to the defense of the schools. And uh, I can't wait to hear what he says about this. We've also got our Let's Catch a Criminal segment where I feature a different U.S. Crime Stoppers group each week. Tonight I'll be speaking with Lieutenant Albert Anderson of the Nassau County Crime Stoppers, and that's the area that I actually grew up in, and maybe we can help them catch a bad guy. And, of course, we're going to start off the show with our true crime report. And I'm still floating around in the blogosphere this week, and I'll be speaking with in cold blogger con- contributor Hart D. Fisher, who has quite a story to tell. But Hart does just about everything. He's a successful horror author, a savage horror filmmaker, those are his words, not mine, a critically acclaimed poet, director of music videos, and he has a long and notorious career as a comic book publisher, where he was dubbed the most dangerous man in comics because of his books on serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer. He's also a champion of freedom of speech over censorship and perhaps of morality gone wrong because he's known for taking his work to the extreme. And his opinions on serial killers has garnered him appearances on programs like CNN Murders by the Number, Numbers, Larry King Live, The Jerry Springer Show, and I bet that was a love fest, and many, many more. But what most people don't know, however, is that the woman he refers to as his first love was the victim of a brutal rape and murder. And the efforts that he's made to see her killer get convicted and that that killer remains in jail for life. It's a heartbreaking story with an unfinished outcome. So without any further palavering on my part, let's welcome Hart Fisher. Hi, Hart. Hi, how are you doing, Susan? I'm I'm doing well in this crazy day. Now, yeah, bullying is an interesting topic. I heard a little bit about that, and I dealt with that quite a bit as a young man and also as a person in art school, and I kind of feel like I was bullied by the mass media. So it's definitely something, a problem in culture that needs to be addressed. Uh, you've, you've definitely been bullied. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, most, the most hated man in, in, in comics. Um, very quickly, just, just so, in case my audience is not familiar with it, just... Give us a little snippet before we talk about the, um, the more serious work that you're doing. 
Well, Why were a, you the most hated man in comics? As a publisher of Boneyard Press, I uh, set a goal for myself to be the scariest, most frightening publisher that ever walked into comics, and I got my wish. I, I, I did books that were so scary, stores were scared to put them on the shelves. And uh, I did books on serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer. I worked with uh, rock stars like Glenn Danzig and ran his comic company, Verotic. I did a story with him, uh, with an author called Christian Moore. Uh, the story's called A Taste of Cherry, and it was about a snuff film. And that shut down Planet Comics and has banned as obscene material in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, I have done spoof books. I faked my death in 1998 for April Fool's Day. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I can yeah. say this on the air. Uh, but let's say I, I did a T-shirt that, that slammed uh, Marvel Comics. It was the Marvel can suck my, uh, well, I'll say rooster instead of the word I used <laughs> on the shirt. And we did those in San Diego. I was a very controversial publisher. I did not take any prisoners. I, I believe that comics were for adults, so I was writing work for my perspective as an adult and as a victim of violent crime. And as a person who's had a violent life, my, my whole life I've dealt with violence and and victimization. I've dealt with rape and murder and suicide since I was a child. And uh, so I had a unique perspective. So when I wrote about horror, to me, violence is ugly. So I always betrayed it that way in my work. And that bothered people because in our society, violence is this fun, slick thing. And it just, it isn't. Violence is not fun. So it is not fun. And I mean, I certainly, uh, I certainly know that from my perspective as well. And, and then Unfortunately, you had an experience up close and personal about this, and that's what I really want you to come and talk to us about today. So let's talk about the rape and the murder and what happened, when was this, what happened, and then we'll talk about what you've been doing about it, because I applaud the work that you've been doing. Well, thank you very much, Susan. It's, it's a real change of pace for me. Uh, I was really brutalized by the media. When I, I did this book on Dahmer to portray him, as the piece of dirt that I felt he was. I felt the media was exploiting serial killers and serial killer culture, and I was trying to portray him as a monster, and instead I got turned around, and the media said that I was exploiting the victims' families, and I got sued by the victims' families, and in the middle of all this, uh, I was making my first film, which was a movie called The Garbage Man, and it's about a black serial killer, and Halfway through shooting, my, uh, my first love, Michelle, was raped and murdered in a motel robbery at the Charterhouse Inn. Uh, it and was, what year was this? This was in 1993. Okay. And we were shooting this film, and I was already a notorious media figure in Champaign, Illinois. So when this story broke, they went crazy with it. They really uh, went off the hog with, you know, uh, author of the Jeffrey Dahmer comic book now knows what it's like to lose a loved one, as if I'd never had loss in my life before, you know. Uh, I had dealt um, with, my girlfriend was raped by one of my co-workers when I was a bouncer at a bar, and that had happened right before my, my girlfriend was murdered, and it just was, was crazy, a crazy time with a lot of violence, and I spent 10 years trying to keep her murderer in prison because there were subsequent trials due to there were changes in, the, it was a, a weird test case involving the Illinois uh, State Supreme Court. They reopened the case after he had been convicted of murder and rape and uh, had gotten the death penalty. And he got a second trial, so we had to reopen everything, all the wounds, and go through it all again. And, and it was a, uh, a sex murder, so I had to testify in court. I was a, a primary witness. My father was one of the last people to talk to her alive before she was murdered. And... Uh, it, it was ugly. It was a real ugly experience, and I was undergoing all of this while I was being belittled in the media, while I was being attacked for my yeah. work in the media, and I was not going to allow talk shows like Jerry Springer or Sally Jesse to exploit my pain. I made sure when I did those shows to tell them, hey, you bring this murder up, I'm walking off your damn show. And mm -hmm. I kept this to myself until last year when I started writing about it on In Cold Blog. And that's a... That, that's a very cathartic thing to do because I know from other people how how much it just you can't hold onto this kind of thing. It really does help, and it and also I think what you're doing inspires people that are that are kind of going through the same injustice. So they let's just just back up a second. So they they commuted his sentence from the death penalty to life in prison. That happened because a good old ex-governor Ryan, who's in prison right now, another wonderful Illinois governor in prison, really, <laughs> uh, he decided 
that he, he felt there was something wrong with the Illinois justice system. So he was going to commute every prisoner's death row sentence to life. And he just decided to do this, well, because he was corrupt as hell and he needed a way to distract the public from what he was doing. Uh, didn't work, but now my guy has got life in prison instead of death. And this is a person who is violent. I mean, this isn't like he might not have been the guy. This is the guy. This is the guy, and he's a violent, convicted felon, and he has stabbed a guard in the face, nearly blinding him. Uh, this is not a good person, and this is a person that I do not want to ever see out on the sidewalk again, having an opportunity to kill somebody else's daughter. And and your fear, when we were talking before, your, your fear is that they're going to somehow be able to bring this guy up for parole. Is that right? That well, the thing actually... that the public has to understand is when you're dealing with the justice system, it's not about justice. Uh, the wheels of justice grind slowly, and you got to really work hard to make sure that you get what you want out of the justice system. Uh, you have to really stick with it because they'll, they'll change the law, there will be a budget crunch, perhaps like in California, the federal government will come in and take away perhaps uh, the ability of the state to run the medical system because they can't even get diabetes medicine to their prisoners. Mm. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. If you, if you have the possibility of letting them loose, it can happen. There was a serial killer that almost got free in Texas. Uh, you never know with the justice system when somebody might get out. You really have to be on top of it. Uh, they, they just don't care. And they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed. They're understaffed. They're under budgeted. Uh, we got real issues with, with the justice system in America. Do you have, or, do they notify you, or, or would they be notifying you if there, have been, or if there are any changes? How do, you, how do you keep up with this? It's something that I've got a network of, of friends and, and friends in law enforcement that are going to give me a heads up, but there's no, I'm not aware of anything that would keep me informed of what's going on with him. Uh, I, I only know about certain things that have happened with him because my, my friends have told me, you know, they've let me know. All right, well, I think that that's an important point. So, you know, that the, some states really don't have notification. I know, I know New York is supposed to, but it's very flawed. Mm -hmm. New York, where I am. Uh, and, I wasn't and notified when he had his sentence changed. I mean, that would be something important. But I wasn't notified of that. Uh, they might have notified Michelle's next of kin and not me. Because mm -hmm. we weren't married, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I really commend your efforts to keep this guy, uh, keep your eye on this guy, and, and uh, I appreciate that so much. If, uh, if Crime Prevention 101 can ever help you out with anything, please let me know. And give out some websites so, so people can see some of these horrible <laughs> comic books. <or. laughs> well, if somebody wants to keep an eye on what I'm doing right now, the best place to find it is at www.americanhorrors.com. That's horrors, plural, uh, because I'm doing horror TV shows and horror movies these days. All right. And check out his blog. It's incoldblogger.blogspot.com. And he's got lots of other things. His website is amazing. I, I love the website. Hart, thanks so much for being with me today. And, again, I really do applaud your efforts to... to you know, stay on top of this situation. And I, this would, I would like to say to, to the people at sure. home listening, to any victim of violent crime out there, you know, you got to understand that you're not alone. You know, you're not alone in this. And remember that you're a victim of the crime. You are a victim. And there, there's a definition of that word. You didn't ask for yeah. it. You didn't want it. Uh, it's not your damn fault. I don't care if you went into the worst part of town wearing a little red cocktail dress. Nobody has to be victimized, so remember that. And there's, there's people out there, seek other crime support networks out, because I know that this thing drove me insane. I went nuts. That's why I started writing poetry. It took me a long time to come out of it and to find myself again. So I urge people out there that who were victims of violent crime that you're not alone. There are people out there, and you can get through this. Thank you so much, and keep listening to Crime Prevention 101 also, because we're here to help you, too. Now, when we come back, we're going to be talking about bullying and a very in different approach to stopping it than you probably heard before. News. 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 News.
hear me. Hear me. Your voice counts. Call toll free 1 866 472 5787. 1 866 472 5787. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention101.com for more information. The Mayan calendar tells us that we will be entering into a 260 day opportunity for us to engage in conscious co creation with great spirit. How will we prepare ourselves for this exciting and unprecedented time in Earth's history? Peter Tong has dedicated over 20 years of his life's work to exploring that which is beyond understanding. Peter will help increase your awareness and education on this enlightening transformation in consciousness. Awakening to Conscious Co-Creation airs live Wednesdays at noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time on 7th Wave Network. Hi, this is Susan Bartlestone, host of Crime Prevention 101, and I want to tell you about My Mobile Witness, a revolutionary service that transforms your camera phone into a personal safety device. My Mobile Witness believes safety is improved when you remove anonymity from dangerous scenarios. If you're in a stalking situation, for example, if you have an order of protection against someone, or if your profession places you in situations that are potentially dangerous, I want you to check out My Mobile Witness. And you parents of college students, Ask the school to check out the My Mobile Witness University program with custom-tailored options aimed at keeping both students and faculty safe. Every campus could benefit from the My Mobile Witness University service. For more information, go to MyMobileWitness.com. Streaming live, the leader in Internet talk radio, VoiceAmerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Susan would like to remind you that no absolutes exist in a crime scenario and no advice can possibly address every variable. Each situation should be evaluated individually and responded to in a way you instinctively judge best. It's Susan's aim on this show to provide you with the information and options that will help you make that instinctive assessment quickly and safely. And if you're already a survivor of the kind of crime we're talking about on the show today or any other crime for that matter. Please remember that there are no right or wrong responses in a criminal encounter, and nothing that happened to you was your fault. Even if you think you used bad judgment in a situation and left yourself vulnerable, that's never an excuse for a crime or for violence. So please, call yourself a survivor, not a victim, and understand that with time, distance, and the proper professional help, you can put what happened into perspective and get on with your life. If you'd like to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, send your comments to solutions at fightsafe.com and Susan may address some of them on future shows. That email address again, solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101. Hi, Susan Bartleson here, and there's plenty of show left to tune in for, so please start tweeting about us, and don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter and Facebook, and I have almost 4,000 friends now, so I want to reach 5,000. So please uh, check me out there. Now, let's talk about bullying with school psychologist uh, and psychotherapist Israel Kalman. And uh, Israel, who's known as Izzy, has more than 20 years' experience working in the schools and is one prominent bullying expert That's bucking the school bashing trend and, in fact, coming to their defense. He writes a blog for Psychology Today, and he's been warning for years that the anti-bullying laws will fail to reduce bullying and will simply make it easy for parents to, to sue schools. He created Bullies to Buddies to provide the correct understanding and solution to the problem of teasing and bullying as he sees it. And he says that the only reason that people become victims of relentless teasing and bullying is that they do not practice freedom of speech. Can't wait to hear more. Izzy, welcome to Crime Prevention 101. Uh, Thank you very much, Susan. 
Uh, thank you for the introduction. Oh, my pleasure. I, I, I really mean it. I, I, I'm very curious. Now, Izzy, you've written an article defending schools like the South Hadley High School where C.B. Prince, the, the, this young woman that uh, killed herself, uh, you, she, you defend them from the responsibility for not ending bullying at the school, and you say that the anti-bullying laws that were passed after the Columbine shooting, which the schools pushed for, are actually the school's worst enemy. Now, this is, this is pretty controversial. Will you explain that, please? Yeah. We think that these anti-bully laws are going to give schools the power to get rid of bullying. But if you don't, if you read them carefully, what the laws do is they hold the school legally responsible for making the bullying stop. But they can't. The research shows that these anti-bully programs, and especially the approach that was being required to use by the law, is either ineffective or, or makes things worse. So how can you hold the schools legally responsible for getting rid of bullying if the programs don't work? What these laws really do is it makes it easy for parents to sue schools for failing to stop their children from being bullied. And in most cases, schools will fail. All right, now you talk about that these programs don't work, and you, you spoke about in that article that there's been research done on the, the tra kind of traditional anti-bullying programs, like the one that uh, was espoused by the South Hadley School, um, yes. that these are, are not reliable. Now, um, would you explain that a little bit? And First of all, I can tell you what the research finds, but I can also explain logically why it doesn't work. Uh, okay. First, let me talk about the research. Uh, in 2004, a research study was published in the, in the a journal of the National Association of School Psychologists. A psychologist named David Smith had done a, a meta-analysis of all of the published research on whole school anti-bully programs. And that's the approach that uh, the consultant at South Hadley uh, uses. He, the anti-bully uh, program. Yeah. A meta-analysis <laughs> means that the researcher looks at all of the published research and treats it like one study. Puts all of the studies together and finds the results. He found that 86% of the published studies showed that the anti-bully program had no benefit or made the problem even worse. Only 14% of the published studies showed that the anti-bully program produced a minor reduction in bullying. And since uh, uh, 2004, two other major meta-analyses have been published showing the same thing. These programs are not being effective. So how can you hold the school responsible for making the bullying go away when the programs don't work? All right, and can you, can you kind of explain a little bit what the anti-bullying approach is? And then we'll talk about what your approach is. So, so what, when you say the anti-bullying approach, what does that actually mean? It, it, it's really a law enforcement approach. Even though supposedly it's a psychological, but it's a law enforcement approach. In the law enforcement approach, we decide that certain behaviors are going to be illegal. Nobody's going to be allowed to do them. We have to protect the population from these behaviors, and we're going to apprehend and punish whoever does them. So bullying is considered a crime, but bullying includes anything that can make anybody feel bad. It includes psychological distress, emotional distress. You're no longer allowed to be sarcastic. If you read many laws on bullying, sarcasm is bullying. You're not allowed to roll your eyes when somebody says something you're stupid in class. You're not allowed to decide that somebody's in your friend because it might hurt their feelings. So now you have to be a saint. Only saints never do things that are called bullying. So if you're not a saint, you get punished. I don't know too many saints. Um, what kind of punishment, by the way, is common if, if you're... If you're going after these bully and you're, these bullies and let's say what, for whatever it is, sarcasm or whatever, I, I actually thought it had to be a little more serious than that. I mean, certainly these these cases, uh, it wasn't just that, that that people were sarcastic to Phoebe Prince, which is the the case of the moment. Uh, but what kind of punishment? Well, what happens is that the media publicizes the really dramatic cases where somebody killed himself or killed somebody else. You know, there's real crimes going on. Uh, nobody's going to want to write an article that uh, so-and-so called somebody else a name and how terrible it is. But that's most of what bullying goes on. 
But even the more serious acts happen from less serious ones. First, you're excluded, you're ridiculed, you start getting angry, you start threatening, it becomes, you know, it builds up. So even the, the, the really horrible acts started from less serious things. And what typical uh, punishment? I'm sorry. Oh, what, you're, you're saying what the punishment should be? Yeah. What What do they typically? If you're If you're following that anti-bullying uh, model, what would let's so so let's say well let's say it's you know even more even more um, uh, let's say it's you know pushing. I mean, calling they they were calling uh, Phoebe Prince a whore. That that's not yeah. really being sarcastic. Well, what, but what would the um, what would the punishment be? What would what do the schools do under this anti-bullying model to punish someone who who calls her a whore or or who slammed her into a locker, which happened to her? What would what would that punishment typically be? In most places today, the mandated punishments are suspension, and after two incidents of suspension, you kick the kid out of school. So that's the mandated that, that's- punishment in most places. That seems to me like it would be effective. Why? Why uh, you're getting rid of the bully in, in, in those series? And this is again, this is I'm, this is not for being sarcastic. You know, this is for for you know something drastic. If someone is sarcastic to you, you're not going to suspend them. Okay, we think that we need to punish people who call somebody else a whore. In a country where we have freedom of speech, we think that it's a crime to insult somebody. It doesn't matter how nasty the insult is. If you call me a whore and I get you punished, is that going to make you want to be nice to me? Well, if I thought it was going to get me suspended, it might. Oh, you're going to want to be I nice mean, to me? If, you know, yeah, if that's you going to make me, me want a, to be nice an hour of detention. Okay, you called me a whore, I told the school, and you, you got suspended. Now you want to be nice to me? Well, it, what, I'm, what I'm saying is I may not want to be nice, but, but I'm thinking that um, it might stop me. If I don't want to be, you know, kicked out of the school, which I might not want to be, it might, I wouldn't want to be nice to, 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 to you, but I might stop taunting you if I didn't want to be you know, thrown out. I mean, I, it seems like that would be effective. I'm, I'm a little shocked that the research shows that this kind of punitive approach isn't effective. You are thinking of a very nice, fearful kid who doesn't want to get in trouble, so okay, I'll be nice now. But if, 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 you're, uh, if I get you punished, you're going to hate me. You're going to do something, want to do something worse to me. You'll try to do something more subtle against me. You'll get friends against me. You'll write stuff on me, about me on Facebook. Uh, you're going to make it more subtle. And you're also going to accuse me of, of doing things to you. If I get you in trouble, you're going to want to get me in trouble. So the incidents escalate. If it worked, I, I would have no problem, but it doesn't work because when we, the, the, about the nastiest thing you could do to somebody is to get them in trouble with the authorities. And if you're not sure about this, try the simple experiment. The next time your neighbor upsets you, call the police on them. They're going to hate you. They're going to make you a pariah in your community. Well, that's it's true, no- and, and, and that's true. Um, I think there's another you know, issue there because... You might, you could kick someone out of school and they'll be going out of the school, but your neighbor is still going to be there. So, you know, this is just a, just seems a little bit different, although I, I do find, I think I understand what you're saying, you know, that, that um, the punitive approach does build resentment. As long as they're, they're still around in the school, Even that's if I not think, actually uh, solving the problem. In my neighborhood. And I get you kicked out of school. You're going to come to my house. You're going to throw eggs at my house when nobody's looking. You're going to get revenge against us. You're going to stick a knife in my father's car, the tires. When we get people in trouble, it makes them hate us. The thing okay, is, the solution is so simple. What we're doing is we're taking the most complicated and difficult solution and using it instead, instead of a much simpler and better solution. All right. You know what? Let's let's do this. Um, we're coming up on a break anyway, so uh, stick around with me for a little while longer. And when we come back, I want to I want to hear what your approach to the problem would be, the bullies to buddies problem. And uh, you can find out more information about his uh, program, bullies to buddies, and that's the number two buddies at his website, which is bullies to buddies dot com. All right. 
Hold on, because we're going to find out what to do about this problem. Ask the experts. Call toll-free right now, 1-866-472-5787. Hello? And ask our all-star team to answer your questions. That's 1-866-472-5787. Thank you for calling. VoiceAmerica.com. Hi, this is Susan Bartlestone, host of Crime Prevention 101. And I want to tell you about My Mobile Witness a revolutionary service that transforms your camera phone into a personal safety device. My Mobile Witness believes safety is improved when you remove anonymity from dangerous scenarios. If you're in a stalking situation, for example, if you have an order of protection against someone, or if your profession places you in situations that are potentially dangerous, I want you to check out My Mobile Witness. And you parents of college students, Ask the school to check out the My Mobile Witness University program with custom-tailored options aimed at keeping both students and faculty safe. Every campus could benefit from the My Mobile Witness University service. For more information, go to MyMobileWitness.com. Frankly Speaking About Cancer is a program designed to empower survivors and their caregivers to deal with the social and emotional challenges of cancer. Drawing on resources from wellness communities throughout America and abroad, the show will invite physicians, researchers, nurses, social workers, patients, and caregivers to share their advice on how to live a better life with cancer. Join host Kim Tibaldo, President and CEO of the Wellness Community, Tuesday afternoons at 1 p.m. Pacific Time and 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Network. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention101.com for more information. Stimulating talk it gets those synapses in the brain firing really fast. All the time. The number one Internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. This is Crime Prevention 101. I'm Susan Bartlestone. Thanks so much for joining me today. Now, we've been talking about bullying with school psychologist and bullying expert Israel or Izzy Kalman. And before the break, we were talking about what not to do, what doesn't work, the, the punitive anti-bullying approach. And now, Izzy, let's talk about your approach to, um, to bullying. I think you call it victim-proofing. Correct. I call it, I call it the victim proof in your school when it comes to working with a school. All right. Now, what is this approach? Why is this different? The solution to bullying has been known for thousands of years. What I'm teaching is not new. Have you heard of something called the golden rule? Sure. The golden rule is a solution to bullying. The problem is people don't understand the golden rule. People think that the golden rule means it's important to be nice to people. We don't need the golden rule for that. It's obvious that it's important to be nice. The problem is, what do you do when people are mean to you? That's the problem. Our, our whole lives are being taught how important it is to be nice. Somebody, so when somebody is mean to us, how do we re- react? <gasps> My God, they can't treat me that way. They're supposed to be nice to me. How dare they be mean to me? So we get angry at them. We want to get them punished. We want revenge. What the golden rule really means is you have to be nice to people even when they're mean to you. And the emotional expression of the golden rule is love your enemy. Loving your enemy is the emotional expression of the golden rule. It means when somebody is mean to you, you have to treat them with love. And if you treat them with love, they stop being your bully. So I, I think is, that... Let me, let me just, just to play devil's advocate here for a bit, because I'm sure you've heard these questions before, but 
this is not e- easy for an adult to do. So how do we expect a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old who barely knows what any rules are, let alone the golden rule, how do we expect them to do something like this? And, and then I want to get more information on what it, what it means, what you would actually recommend them do. But how, how can they think about this? That is an excellent question because I keep on seeing articles about what parents can do to help their kids stop being bullied. They can't because they themselves don't know how to stop being bullied. Uh, the most amount of bullying goes on right at home. The divorce rate is 50 percent. Why? Because couples are nice to each other. A lot of people have a hard time getting along with bosses and colleagues. In most families, the kids are fighting every day. So the adults don't know how to make the bullying stop. So how can they teach the kids? They can't. So what you have to do is you have to have a good way of teaching them. So I teach people, whether it's adults or children, I teach people how to use the golden rule to solve your problems all by themselves. And if you want, I can demonstrate. Yes, that is, you know, We can talk about it endlessly, but a role play can be more effective than all of the explanations. Okay. But so let's say I'm another girl, and I want you to call me a whore. By the way, I, I, I need you to go along with me. Let me guide this role play. I want you okay. to call me a whore, and don't let me stop you. The, the, the game is for you to call me a whore, and I, and I have to make you stop. But don't let me stop you. Go ahead. All right. Izzy, you're a whore. You went after my boyfriend. You I'm know, not a whore. Don't call me a whore. I'm, you're a whore. And, and, I'm and not a whore. I, and, I'm and not a whore. Don't call me a whore. And, I, and, and, and if you keep doing this, I'm going to smack you in the face. Look, you stop calling me a whore. I'm going to tell the principal right away. You do that and you'll a get a knuckle sandwich. What? So you do that and you'll get a knuckle sandwich. Well, I'll get you even, even bigger trouble. Bully. I'll get you in, in even bigger trouble. I'm going to get kicked out of school. Okay, l- l- uh, l- let me st- stop you here. I'm not such a good bully, yeah. Izzy. I've, 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 I try to practice the golden rule, so I'm not doing this as well as I probably could. Someone else could. But, you're, you're, you're all right, great. so I hear where you're going. You're no, you don't see anything. Let me, let, let me lead you. Did I make you want to stop calling me a whore? No. In fact, now you want to give me a knuckle sandwich. Could you respect me for my behavior? Well, the principal on me, I would. Yes, you're right. That's what I would have said. You, you, you're telling me you're going to give me a knuckle sandwich, so I'm, I'm making you hate me even more. I'm, I'm making you want to do something even worse to me. Susan, right. could you respect me for my behavior? All right. So now, so what's the so proper asking, way? Could, could you respect me for my behavior? Would I? No. Yeah, could you? The way I was acting. Don't call me a whore. I'm going to tell on you. Could you respect me for my behavior? No, not at all. No, I sound like an idiot. Was I treating you like a friend or an enemy? Um, you were treating me like a scared rabbit. But was I treating you like, a, like you were my friend or my enemy? Uh, yeah, you were my enemy. Yeah. I'm going to, you can't talk to me like that. I'm angry with you. I'm, I'm going to get you punished. I'm treating you like you are my enemy. Now we're going to do it again. I'm going to give, give, give you freedom of speech and treat you like a friend. Call me who or all you want. Start again. All right. Izzy, you're a whore. You better stay away from my boyfriend or I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. I really shouldn't have slept with him. It was really a terrible thing I did. That's what you would tell them to say? Sure. Really? Well, doesn't, it stop you in your tr- doesn't it stop you in your tracks? You know, didn't interestingly I stop, enough... Didn't I just stop I, you I, in your I tracks? Hear, I, okay, I heard that, but I just want to tell you that interestingly enough, though, because and, and, I've read a lot about the Phoebe Prince uh, case, and she apparently... Can I, can I ask a favor? You, you asked me a question. I would really like to finish answering it. Okay. I want to explain about the Golden Rule. We did okay. it twice. The second time, did you want to keep on calling me a whore? Probably not, but you stopped right I wouldn't away. have trusted you. You stopped. I stopped you right away. Could you respect right, me Right, but I was a little incredulous, you know, that you would agree. But it's you true. I slept with say. your boyfriend. Yeah, of course you're going to call me a whore. I slept with your boyfriend. Of course you're mad at me. So instead of saying, don't call me a whore, I'm going to get you in trouble, I acknowledge it. Yeah, I did a terrible thing. I shouldn't have slept with your boyfriend. And I acknowledge it, so you, you appreciate me for acknowledging you. You stop putting me down. Uh, could you respect me more the second way? 
I I think I don't know about respect. I'm not even sure these these bullies are capable of respect. But it did it did stop me in my tracks. Susan, we're spreading lies about bullies. We had this image of a bully as a psychopath who has no conscience. It is not true. A tiny, tiny percentage of people are psychopaths with no conscience. Most of these kids that we call bullies are ordinary kids. They're just not saints. So please don't think, oh, these bullies aren't like that. They're ordinary kids. Most of the kids we well, call bullies are ordinary kids, but they're not saints. Very few of us are saints. The second way you can respect me more because I didn't sound like an idiot. And let I me ask you whether you're no... more likely to want to be nice to you. When I say, don't call me a whore, I'm going to tell the principal on you. When I tell you, you know, that it was really a terrible thing, I shouldn't have slept with him, I'm so sorry about it. When are you more likely to want to be my friend? All right. Well, listen, Izzy. Let me. Let me. Uh, there's another point, though, that I was that I was getting at, and, and you know, uh, this is a gray area for me because I'm. Uh, you know, I, I do know that there's no profile for. Uh, you know, they're they're not misunderstood. They're not victimized themselves. They they run the these bullies run the gamut from from uh, all kinds of homes and families. But the the Phoebe Prince case involved doing that. She didn't. She didn't know that these two guys that were at the cause of her being bullied had gone after her and they both had other girlfriends. When she found out, she went to those girlfriends and she did apologize to them. And she said, I hope we're okay. I mean, I saw, I read this in People magazine and they, they, she tried, I think, kind of the golden rule, but it did not stop the bullying. So what do you do if the golden rule doesn't? Stop the bullying. First of all, people think that she was using the golden rule. It is not enough to do things right once in a while. You have to do everything right. So maybe she did some things that were right, but she did other things that were wrong. The fact that she was letting it upset her was wrong. If, if, it lets her, if, if she gets upset, she's really doing it to herself. We don't realize that when we get upset, we do it to ourselves. And then the people yeah, that's that true, but she's, four, she's 14. <laughs> They don't know what ends no, up, let alone, nobody, you know, what... Nobody taught her how to deal with it. I have worked with many kids who wanted to, kill, to commit suicide. Every one of them is still alive. My website has saved the lives of people. But nobody is teaching them how to handle it. We're teaching them that nobody has a right to insult you. Nobody has a right to bully you in, you, in, in any way. So when we teach that to kids, and kids are bullied, do they think, oh, it's no big deal? They think, oh my God, they can't treat me that way. They're not allowed to insult me. They're not allowed to be mean to me. So our anti-bully education is making the problem worse. It's teaching kids they should get upset by these things. So instead of not getting upset, they get more upset by it, which makes, makes the problem escalate. We're teaching kids the wrong thing today. Nobody's teaching them the right thing. Well, I, you know, I do hear you, and uh, I tell you what, I mean, this would have been, this would have been difficult for me to do, and uh, I don't, you know, because, I, because I, nobody I, taught you. That you can teach I, your I didn't learn. Again. I learned this stuff. I didn't learn this stuff in school. Nobody taught it to me. It took me decades to realize this. But it's there. We well. just learn on the mound. Now, most people in the country are Christians. And most Christians have no idea what Jesus taught. Read the Sermon on the Mount. He teaches the Golden Rule. He teaches love your enemy, uh, turn the other cheek. If somebody, uh, don't get angry, which means don't get angry at people when they're mean to us. Jesus taught it, but we don't understand it. Well, you know, look, I'll tell you what. When people, I, this is what I want to do on the show because it's a very different approach. And if it saves lives, I want people to hear about it. Um, you know, I always recommend uh, when, when people come to me uh, that their kid is being bullied, I tell them to put their kid into martial arts because it strengthens their sense of self, it empowers them, it gives them self-esteem, it teaches them to control anger, and or, but if that bullying takes a physical form, a dangerous one, you know, maybe that kid can protect themselves, so... If the golden rule does it, what is it? Carry a golden rule, but uh, also have a big stick, or what is that? Uh, if somebody's looking to injure you, be nice, you, but have a big if, stick, right? Somebody's trying to injure you, no matter what. Of course, you have to protect yourself. Of course, you have to hit them back if you have no choice. But I have no objection to martial arts. Martial arts is wonderful. 
first of all, it gives the kids physical strength and confidence. And even the martial arts teach what I teach. No martial artist teaches you that if somebody insults you, smash their face in. They teach you not to do it. You're not allowed to hit, hit people. And it, the martial arts does not always work in stopping the bullying. Because let's say I got a black belt and you're insulting me. And I say, shut your mouth, I'll smash your face in. I'm not allowed to smash your face in. So no, even though I have a black belt, I'm not allowed to use it again, oh. so I'll get in trouble. So you can laugh that's, at me, ha, 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 you have a black belt, ha, ha, ha. That's only, because, that's only if, they, if they do more than insult you. If they come after you physically, that's where that black belt comes in. But, exactly. busy, but I can't most, believe it. We've actually run through, run through this whole uh, segment here. And I thank you so much for being with me today. I think it's important what you have to say. I'm, I'm glad I ha- had the chance to bring it to people. And I want people to check out your website. It's um, Bullies to Buddies, right? Bullies to Buddies with a two dot com. Yeah, dot com, yeah. All right. Thank you so Bye. much for being with me today. Yeah, thank you very much, Susan, for having me. Uh, can I, do I, I have pass. time for, uh, to say something quickly? Actually, we're we're out of time. But okay, if you okay. want to, if you want to email me with it, I'll make sure that I post it for you. How's that? Oh, okay, I don't know if there's any point to it. But do you notice? All how right. Much well, listen. Resistance? This is Crime yeah. Prevention 101. Coming up, okay. let's catch a criminal with Nassau County crime stuffers from my hometown. Talk, talk, talk. That's all we do is talk. Yeah! If you'd like to talk, call us toll-free right now at 1-866-472-5787. 1-866-472-5787. That's it. That's it. VoiceAmerica.com. After more than 17 years' experience teaching safety skills to thousands of women and men, crime prevention and personal safety expert Susan Bartlestone concluded that by thinking and responding quickly, ideally within 20 seconds, potentially violent criminal encounters can be prevented. Using techniques from many different disciplines and illustrated by 60 real-life examples and success stories, Susan shows how it's done in her new book, Think Fast and Prevent a Violent Crime, How to Respond to Danger in 20 Seconds or Less. Check out www.crimeprevention101.com for more information. To perform at your maximum potential, you need to have all aspects of your life working properly. On Mind, Brain, and Body, Dr. Michael John Kell will bring you honest, open discussions concerning your physical, mental, and financial health. If you're ready to find purpose and meaning in your life, tune in to Mind, Brain, and Body every Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific. Mind, Brain, and Body on Voice America Health & Wellness. Radio dedicated to your health, wealth, wisdom, and purpose. Stimulating talk gets those synapses in your brain inspired really fast. All the time. The number one internet talk station where your opinion counts. VoiceAmerica.com. You're listening to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. We invite you to share your stories, tips, or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, and Susan will address some of these on future shows. Send your story or idea to solutions at fightsafe.com. That email address again is solutions at fightsafe.com. Now, back to Crime Prevention 101 with Susan Bartlestone. Hello again. This is Susan Bartlestone. And I want to remind you that Crime Prevention 101 is available on iTunes. You don't even have to be at your computer to listen to all this goodness. And don't forget, we also have a blog site, crimeprevention101.com, where I post links and information about show topics and my wonderful guests. Now, this week I'm featuring uh, Crime Stoppers of Nassau County, New York, in our Let's Catch a Criminal segment, and I'll be speaking with Lieutenant Albert Anderson who's the coordinator of this Crime Stoppers organization. Lieutenant, welcome to Crime Prevention 101. Thank you for having me. Now, talk a little bit about what Crime Stoppers is for people that don't know. Okay. Um, the Crime Stoppers program of Nassau County, it's a private, not for, not-for-profit corporation that began in Nassau County in 1995. It's uh, community-based, and it involves the police, the public, and the media in a fight against crime. Um, Nassau County Crime Stoppers uses cash rewards of up to $5,000 as an incentive to elicit information that would contribute to the arrest of an individual who has committed a crime in Nassau County. 
Mm-hmm. We also pay uh, up to $5,000 reward money for verifiable information that will prevent a crime and for uh, any criminal act or conspiracy to commit a criminal act that would pose a threat to national security. And uh, something like that we would also pay on and we would be considered. Uh, no, pa- and- no tax. I'm sorry. As you say, crime stoppers organizations are all over this country and in many other countries as well. It's a huge network of of organizations. Uh, Correct. And uh, it's an extremely valuable tool to the police, both nationally and internationally. Um, And the trick, of course, the the secret is that it's anonymous. Uh, Yes, exactly. And, uh, like, we have three methods for a person to submit a tip to us. And uh, the the first and most frequently used method is for them to call the hotline, which is uh, 1-800-244-TIPS. Uh, a second method would be online at our website, which is nassaucounty.crimestoppersweb.com. And uh, our last and newest method is text, text messaging. And uh, all the ah. first would have... Yeah, it's it's uh, it's new, and uh, all they would have to do is text the code word NCCS, which is just short for Nassau County Crime Stoppers, plus the tip, and they would send it to Crimes, and uh, we would get the information. And it's all anonymous; we don't know who they are. Uh, I the think that's uh, yeah. I think that's the that's the um, that's the key to why it's so successful. Yes, and uh, what happens is that how it works is when a person calls in with a tip, the uh, the tip is taken, a detective would take it, um, they take the information, then they do a preliminary investigation to verify the facts of the criminal activity. After they verify this information, they forward it to the appropriate uh investigating agency. In other words, like if a person called in with uh, somebody who's dealing drugs or there's drug activity in a certain area, uh, a tip like this would go to our narcotics unit. Uh, a person who, uh, if they gave a tip on who gave, uh, committed a burglary, uh, the detective squad that covers that particular area where the burglary occurred would get the information. Uh, when they call in with this information, we would give them a code number. So we, we don't ask for their name. In fact, we tell them that we, we don't want to know who you are, just, you know, give us your information, and uh, we give them this code number. And now if they have more information on that particular tip, and they call us back, they use that code number to identify themselves. Um, What they do is we um, we ask them to call back periodically to get an update on the case. So if based on their tip an arrest is made, uh, they would be eligible for a reward. And... uh, our Crime Stoppers Board of Directors, they uh, approve any rewards and the amount. And uh, let's say an arrest was made, the person calls back, gives their code number. We tell them, yes, an arrest was made based on the information you gave us, um, and you will get a reward. We give them a second number and tell them what bank to go to to collect this reward. And I've, I do a lot of interviewing. I, I've, I've done many of the Crime Stoppers programs, and they were telling me that a lot of people do not even want the reward. They, they're doing this so that they can help their community and, you know, catch criminals and stuff like that. Exactly. It, sometimes people will call in, and they give us the information, and they tell us right from the get-go that they're not interested in any reward, and we take the the information and pass it on to the appropriate uh, unit that would investigate it. Uh, something like that where they tell us right from the get-go that they don't re- uh, want a reward. We don't, if an arrest is made, we don't even present that to the um, Crime Stoppers Board. But frequently we go through the whole process. It goes before the board. They approve uh, an amount and the reward. Um, we do all the appropriate paperwork and uh, the people never go to the bank, or they never call back to collect the uh, the reward. Uh, as an example, this year we have a total amount approved for rewards. So far this year is twenty one thousand dollars, but we've only paid out thirteen thousand two hundred. So there's what seventy eight hundred dollars that hasn't been collected, and this money I... will end up going right back into the pot to 
be given out again as a, another reward. I think that's so heartening. You know, that it, I, I like to say this is this show has an optimistic perspective on a sober subject, and th- these are the little highlights for me that that people, you know, are really out there, and that and that things can be done, and and that there's no physical, you know, material reward that they're looking for. I, I think that's fantastic. No, I so do I. Now, I really do. Lieutenant, is there a particular case that uh, very quickly we just have a couple of minutes? that you'd like some information about. I know I have listeners in Nassau County. Okay, yeah, we have um, a double homicide that occurred in Freeport, New York, uh, on Monday, April 6th of 2009, at about uh, 9 p.m., uh, a Christopher Clark and a Brendan Lawrence were walking on Jesse Street in Freeport. Uh, they were shot to death on the sidewalk uh, while, as they were walking down the street. The uh, one person's car was found around the corner, but we haven't gotten any information on this particular homicide. So if, uh, if there's someone out there that does have the information, if they could call our hotline, the 1-800-244-TIPS, or uh, our website, or the uh, text messaging, we would certainly appreciate the, um, the information. And, again, they remain anonymous. Uh, and, you know, we're Give hopefully that we... tip line number one more time. The tip line number is 1-800-244-TIPS, and TIPS numerically is 8477. All right. Thank you so much. And the website is NassauCountyCrimestoppersWeb.org, correct? Yeah, NassauCounty.CrimestoppersWeb.com. .com? Correct. Okay. Got it wrong. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being with me. And this no one, I rat- thank you. Oh, my pleasure. I love Crime Stoppers. I hope we help you catch. Uh, I hope we catch, help you catch this guy. I I hope so too. And I, I really I thank you very much for the time. Greatly appreciate. All right. It. Well, that's a wrap for now, my wonderful audience. So please don't forget that we always love to hear from you. By all means, go to my host page at voiceamerica.com and post your comments and suggestions. Tell your friends about us, too. Crime Prevention 101 on voiceamerica.com. And I will see you again next week when I'll have more stories that demand to be told, more hot crime topics, and, of course, lots of tips and resources. It would be a crime not to listen, so stay tuned and stay safe. We hope you got some useful information and inspiration this week on Crime Prevention 101. Susan Bartlestone invites you to join us again next Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific at 8 p.m. Eastern Time here on Voice America. If you want to learn more about Susan's guest, sign up for her newsletter, or find out about upcoming teleseminars and workshops, go to www.crimeprevention101.com today. Have a great week and a safe week.